Good afternoon and welcome to the California Department of Education's Centering and Cultivating the Black Workforce to Strengthen P3 Alignment webinar. We are very excited to be here with you today. I am Valentina Ware and I am one of the presenters for today's webinar. We have a few quick logistics to run through before we get started. We will be taking Q&A or question and answer in the Q&A feature. So please feel free to communicate with us there and ask questions if needed. Lastly, we will have the slide deck available for those who would like a copy of this webinar. I will now pass it to William McGee to uh, do his welcome on behalf of our state superintendent. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, Valentina. I truly appreciate it. And as you stated, you're excited to be here. I am excited to be here. And I know that I will be asking for a copy of this webinar. Now, I don't know whose picture that is, but that's not me. I'm just messing with everybody. That's our state superintendent of public instruction. And on behalf of our state superintendent of public instruction, Mr. Tony Thurman, I would like to say greetings and hello. He absolutely wanted to be here with us today. However, he was unfortunately pulled into a meeting and will be unable to attend, but he does send his regards. I'm excited that I can join all of you today on his behalf to learn about how we may truly center the Black community by specifically focusing on Black educators in this second part of a three-part series. Really focusing on how to recruit and not only recruit but retain Black educators is a very important topic. And this topic will be joyful for us on a Thursday afternoon and an incredibly important topic as we focus on how to create supportive environments for our Black educators. Creating these authentically supportive environments will not only recruit more Black educators because they can see themselves reflected in their work environment, but also, as I mentioned earlier, retain them by maintaining an environment where Black educators are comfortable, supported, seen, heard, and feel valued as an integral part of education for all children and explicitly meet the needs of Black children and their families from preschool through third grade. As you will hear from the presenters and panelists today, having a more diverse education systems that are not only obvious to the eye, but felt by all parties involved, including staff, students, and families, will create higher success rates for our young learners. And I can tell you in my elementary education, I had several Black teachers, which really shaped my identity and helped me learn who I am. When children have the experience to have a Black educator in their educational journey, they are proven to have higher chances of success through increased test scores, greater likelihood to pursue higher education, and most importantly, have a greater attachment to school and learning. Having a Black educator not only benefits Black children, it benefits all children because of the experience and the culture that Black educators bring. These are benefits we all want to elevate across early education and elementary classrooms in California. I hope the resources and perspectives shared today help you incorporate and uplift the benefits of Black educators for all children, and specifically our Black children moving forward. I appreciate you all being here, showing this investment from you and giving your time to learn about this important topic. And I know that our team who put together this webinar is always looking for feedback in areas where we can support you all. Again, thank you for your time and participation. Please enjoy the rest of the webinar, and I appreciate you all allowing me to give this opening. I will now pass it on to Sarah Neville Morgan for introductions. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, William. We're delighted that you were here to introduce for us and give us the warm welcome from our state superintendent, Tony Thurmond. And for everybody else, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Centering and Cultivating the Black Workforce to Strengthen P3 Alignment webinar. This is the second in our series focusing on Black children and students. The first one, Centering and Cultivating Black Families' Voices 
to strengthen preschool through third grade alignment was several months ago back in February. And this is our 16th edition of the Opportunities for All branch pre-kindergarten through third grade or P3 webinar series. Our 16th. I don't think when we started this that we thought we'd have so many, but they have been so successful that we continue to add needed topics and those that have focused on deep equity issues like Black children and families and American Indian children and families are near and dear to our heart. And so we're so excited for today. I'd like to go on with introductions. So we already said who I was. I'm a deputy superintendent of public instruction here at the California Department of Education. And with me, I am joined by Cheryl Cotton, the deputy superintendent in the measurement branch and at measurement and administration branch at CDE. And you just heard from William Mickey. In addition, we are also joined by Sterling E. Williams. So next slide. Who's an education program consultant in the California Department of Education Expanded Learning Division. And Valentina Ware, a child development consultant in the UPK Implementation and Support Office within the Early Education Division. I have to give a huge thanks to both of them for these series and especially for Valentina who really helped craft the entire thing. So I am ecstatic to be here with you today and for all of us to get to hear a presentation from Dr. Stewart on how to center and cultivate the black workforce to strengthen P3 alignment. Through her storytelling style, she will share her experience as a black educator. She will share how we can support the Black community to be valued as a true part of the education system for the benefit of our Black educators because we absolutely need to increase their presence in our schools and find ways to retain Black educators. But also for the benefit of young children and their families who need to see a reflection of themselves to see the leadership pathways and feel part of the community we call education. I'm now gonna pass this over to Sterling who will give us the land acknowledgement and African enslaved ancestors acknowledgement. Over to you, Sterling. Thank you, Sarah. We would like to take a moment to first acknowledge that November is Native American Heritage Month. And together we acknowledge the original peoples of California and their deep connections to the land on which our UPK programs now sit. Tribal communities are critical partners in our work to affirm and celebrate diversity by always supporting inclusive, culturally and linguistically affirming early learning opportunities for all children. To learn more about how California is celebrating Native American Heritage Month, a link will be dropped into the chat for you to save and look at at your own convenience. We would also like to provide a formal land acknowledgement. The Nisenan people, the Southern Meadu, Valley and Plains Miwok, Putwin, Wintu peoples, and the people of the Wilton Rancheria, Sacramento's only federally recognized tribe. We give thanks to all 574 federally recognized nations. We acknowledge that they have undergone systematic genocide and disenfranchisement for centuries. We honor them and acknowledge that we and every single one of us must work in solidarity with indigenous folks to create an equitable society that centers the full humanity of native peoples. And in addition, we will provide an African enslaved ancestors acknowledgement. I acknowledge the nearly 4 million African people, my ancestors, upon whose enslaves backed, along with the land stolen from indigenous people, the United States wealth and prosperity was built. For all those who lost, who were lost, for all those who were stolen, for all those who were left behind, for all those who were not forgotten, 
way we all do this work. Thank you, and I will now pass to Cheryl Cotton to talk about the research conducted by the Learning Policy Institute on diversifying the teacher profession and the trends we see with race and ethnicity and teacher residency completion. Sterling, thank you. And thank you for the African Enslaved Ancestors Acknowledgement. That was powerful. Um, it makes me think of, of my Angelou, I Am the Dream and the Hope of the Slave, one of my favorite poems, um, Still I Rise. So thank you so much for that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheryl Cotton. I'm Deputy Superintendent of our in Instruction Measurement and Administration Branch, Sarah, um, here at the California Department of Education. And throughout my career, I've served as an elementary teacher, principal, uh, district, county office, and state administrator. So I'm so glad to be here. In the Learning Policy Institute report, Diversifying the Teaching Profession, How to Recruit and Retain Teachers of Color by Desiree Carver-Thomas, her research findings focused on the benefits of diversity in the teaching workforce, barriers to recruiting and retaining teachers of color, and promising practices such as high retention and supportive pathways into teaching, hiring and induction strategies, and improving school teaching conditions through improved school leadership. In this report, research shows that teachers of color help close the achievement gaps for students of color and are highly rated by students of all races. Unfortunately, although there's an increase in uh, the recruitment of teachers of color in general, it is slow and attrition rates are high. So our new teachers are not being retained. In addition, when digging deeper into the research, only a small percentage of educators of color are black educators. In fact, this report from the Learning Policy Institute shares that although the population of teachers of color is growing, black educators are declining in the teacher workforce. All students benefit from increased teacher diversity and it is an overall rate improvement strategy for closing achievement gaps. But the impact is especially significant for students of color, which is seen through higher test scores, higher school, high school graduation rates, and increased likelihood to succeed in college. This is due to having teachers of color who serve as role models and support their attachment or student's attachment to school and learning. An additional bonus to everything stated is fewer unexcused absences and less likelihood of being chronically absent. Some additional benefits listed in the research findings of this report are as stated, higher test scores, specifically in reading and math. Positive perceptions from students of their teachers of color include being cared for and academically challenged, and socially and emotionally greater diversity in the education system supports students and teachers to have less feelings of isolation, frustration, and fatigue because they are represented in their environment by students having role models that look like them as well as educators feeling supported when they feel alone, if and when teachers of color leave the profession. Some of the barriers to recruiting and retaining teachers of color in this report are inadequate teacher preparation, including preparation for leadership to support a diverse staff, which increases teacher turnover rates. Teacher licensure exams that disproportionately exclude teacher candidates from color, poor working conditions and displacement from the high need schools they teach in due to closing schools rather than investing in improvements. Our guest speaker, Dr. Taisha Stewart, will expand on this topic today and additionally focus on solutions for diversifying the teaching profession as we work together to center and cultivate the black workforce to strengthen P3 alignment for our youngest learners. If you want to learn more about this research conducted by the Learning Policy Institute, the link to the report will be placed in the Zoom chat. Next slide, please. As we work on recruiting more teachers to diversify the, the profession, teacher residencies in California have increased. The Learning Policy Institute conducted research on the teacher residencies offered and published a fact sheet on their website on, on April 27, 2023, titled The Early Impact of Teacher Residencies in California. The link to this fact sheet will also be posted in the chat shortly. Based on their research, educator residency programs prepare about one in 10 new teachers 
and about 60% of residency completers are teachers of color, which is reflected in this pie chart. If we break that percentage down even further, only 2% of the identified 60% are black educators. This is lower than the overall proportion of black Californians, which is 6.5%. How can we work on increasing that number so that more children can see themselves reflected in the classrooms and in their schools? That's the question that we will ponder more today with Dr. Stewart. And following our panel discussion, I will share some steps CDE is taking to address the issues raised today. I will now pass it to Valentina so that she may introduce Dr. Stewart before beginning her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Cotton. Next, I am excited to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Taisha Stewart. Dr. Stewart is a birth to five home visiting program supervisor at Children Institute Incorporated. She also teaches child development courses and mentors students at Rio Hondo Community College. I do want to point out that this is a more updated work history for Dr. Stewart as the webinar announcement did not reflect her current employers. Now, having over 20 years experience in the early education profession has truly taught her the value of relationship focused work. She is a passionate, supportive leader with a high value for building healthy relationships with staff and students. Her experience includes several years of educating and training future teachers and supporting professionals through reflective coaching. It is a sincere pleasure for her to share her knowledge and experiences with others in the preschool through third grade education profession. Super excited, cannot wait to hear all of the good things that you have to say, Dr. Stewart. We will go ahead and go to the next slide and I will hand it over to you, Dr. Stewart. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Stewart, and it is a pleasure and honor to be here today. I am very excited about this. Um, my heart is overwhelmed with joy at just the passion and all the knowledge that has been shared so far. Um, I want to kind of start off by setting the scene up just a bit. Today, I'll be acting as a griot. For those that are unfamiliar with the West African tradition and title, in short, it pretty much is a historical or tribal storyteller and or messenger. So I would like us to kind of use that as, the, as part of the pathway in the journey through my presentation today. Uh, first, I'd like to also start off by honoring all the African-American Black educators that were before me, those that taught me, hugged me and loved me. And it's part of the reason why I am here today. I also want to honor the formal and informally trained educators in my family. My grandmother, Katherine Stewart, she was grandma to everybody in the community. My uncle daddy, Johnny Wyndham, and Miss Pat Chappelle, who sold into the, the lives of children spiritually, financially, and emotionally, and still does. Looking toward our future, we need more African-American educators. Next slide, please. Right now, I just want us to pause and take a look at those, the pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. I would like to specifically highlight the elder in the color photo, Miss Wilhelmina Henry. She lived to be 102 years old. She was Stockton Unified's first Black teacher who passed last year in 2022. According to resources, Ms. Wilhelmina Henry earned her degree and came with experience from Tuskegee Institute. Although her degree and experience were recognized by officials then, it was decided not to offer her a full-time job because of her race as told by uh, personnel officers then. I would like to take some time to take you on a short journey through this history. Take a look at all the faces on this, this slide. Kind of reflect back, what do you remember? 
the humans captured in this moment walking in victory in the presence of hate. These were children and teens desiring education and at the same time were making history. Next slide. I would briefly like to take you on and a little bit of a reflective pause as you consider the pictures and the faces that you just seen saw. Who would think or why would anyone believe that Blacks did not value education? Why would people risk their lives to be counted as present during attendance? if they did not value education. Just think about that. And don't worry, I'll wait. I wonder where that belief began. Is it even true? I don't think so, but based on history, I must reject this belief. As we journey on through this presentation, I want to use the term a symbol uh, from the Akan proverb meaning, it is not taboo to go back for what you forgot or left behind. Now I know many don't like looking back at the past, but the past often informs us. And so let's reflectively look at our past. Next slide. Just some quick looking back at our past. In 1868, the 14th Amendment guaranteeing every citizen equal rights and equal access to education. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education ruled racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. Next slide. <clears throat> I want to highlight uh, February 25th, 1956, Senator Byrd issued the call for massive resistance, which resulted in tens of thousands of black teachers and principals losing their jobs. So as a result of this and the massive resistance, black teachers and principals lost their jobs. Next slide. Some things I want to highlight um, on this slide, just um, some results resulting from our past. African-American educators feeling the effects of macroaggression, workplace discrimination, overcrowded classroom, lack of empathy, support, and leadership prompts many to leave the profession today. Now, as we pause and consider and think historically what has occurred, it appears to me there's always been a shortage of African-American Black educators. Um, but what the perfect time now to begin making some systemic changes in that. So let's take another reflective pause really quick. In what way have these historical exclusionary racist deeds still inform our hiring practices today? How is it that these deeds still remain alive th and thriving today in education across multiple systems? Let's kind of think about that. As you can see on the PowerPoint, there's underrepresentation of African American college instructors specifically in teaching credential programs. I am a community college educator, and so I can see the deficit there. Next slide. Just some, um, I was mentioned earlier Learning Policy Institute, uh, June 2022 had some shocking statistics and where 61% of the TK through 12 workforce identifies as white. 
And then when you go all the way down to the bottom, guess what you see? 4% black. That's very disheartening to me, especially while the majority of our students are students of color, yet it's rare that they may have a black educator experience. Yes, I said experience. Next slide. African American educators expect greatness from their students. Uh, that's definitely one reason why we need to be in these spaces to support not only African American children, but all students. Uh, University of North Carolina discovered some positive effects of having an African American Black uh, educators. One being lower rates of discipline for African American students. African American students who had just one African American teacher by third grade were 13% more likely to enroll in college. I don't know about all of you, but I do know that some of the black educators I had, it was always encouraged to go to college, to be something great. And those are warm, fond memories I have of my own uh, educational experience with black teachers. I'm sure we all have a number of those that we can share at any given time. Teachers' beliefs about students' college potential can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I, for one, can say that that is true. Myself, I probably would not have gone to college, but due to the encouragement of Black teachers and my family and those um, mentors in our community helped me to achieve. And I'm a doctor today. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about recruitment and retainment recommendations. Uh, from my experience, I come through the lens of relationships. And so in my vast and wide experience working in different parts of education, whether it be after school programming or teaching in class, um, also working behind the scenes with uh, human resources departments, I've learned a few things. And I've definitely learned relationships matter. Definitely. Next slide. So some things I learned about human resources department in working with them and also uh, a lot of statistics out there showing uh, some important facts uh, that are coming up with the hiring process. So some of my recommendations are changing outdated hiring practices. Um, I sat on a committee where we looked at and reviewed those exclusionary words and tones that are often embedded in job descriptions that we consider very normal or professional. And without even knowing it, some of those statements and those words are very exclusionary, specifically to African-American and Black educators. Another thing I think is very important is to be transparent, publish the salary. And I think that is very important because educators already come in probably with a lot of experience. And I just feel it's an unjust thing to offer a master's degree educated teacher the First scale rate on a salary scale. Another thing I'd like to um, recommend is diversify the interview panels. There's something to be said when an educator comes in for an interview and there's 13 people on the panel and none of them look like that teacher. They're a representative of other races and sometimes that can imbalance the field there. For, uh, and I think it's important for us to really look at how we do interviews. I don't, I have not yet to see the need or the benefit of having 13 people, more importantly, 13 Caucasian people on the interview panel for one educator. 
limit the interview panel to three or four people. Another thing, thoroughly review employment recruitment agencies. That tends to be the most popular way to go. You have a lot of different organizations that you can funnel your job to and they can post. And then sometimes we hire our own recruiters. And sometimes those agencies rely on algorithm, rhythmic, I'm sorry, biases and can be detrimental to equitable hiring practices. Ensure their values and ethics align with yours. Make sure they also have representation in their organization. I think that's very important. Uh, some things I've also noticed uh, have included the pre-employment assessments. While there may be a very good, and I understand the need for that, sometimes those uh, assessments are biased. So it may be helpful to ensure the tests align with positions and job duties. Uh, according to research, assessments tend to introduce biases and lead to discrimination. So we need to really think how we're even going about the whole hiring practice. And so I, for one, am about maybe going back to the old school way, but that's just me. But I think the more technology we include, uh, sometimes feels like there's a inherent bias that's definitely going to be it, be attached to the process of recruiting and hiring. Next slide. Hmm. So first, I'd like to say welcome and embrace Black excellence. We are here. We desire to spread joy, love, intellect, and wisdom. Accept it and embrace it. Accept culturally centered pedagogy. Storytelling, for example. I love storytelling. If I had an hour to myself, I'd fill you up with a lot of relevant stories. And I'd also believe that we storytell. We use storytelling in our classrooms. We use storytelling when we're relating to students and it, it gets a message across, a message of care and of love. And it is an effective strategy, by the way. I also wanna highlight that when you, when hiring African-American and black educators, we come with a lot. We are authors. We are consultants, we are trainers, we are curriculum writers, we are keynote speakers, we are leaders. We don't just come in one line, we come with a multitude of gifts and talents and treasures. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, I think um, it's important for me to say this over and over again, relationships matter. Um, and relationships, when we're authentically trying to shift the work culture, they matter, they make a difference. People enjoy coming to work. <laughs> um, I'd like to start off by pri prioritizing building authentic, safe, professional relationships. Oftentimes, we come to work and sometimes we're met with those tones, those uh, apprehensions, those things that make working in certain environments uncomfortable. I'd like for us to begin challenging implicit and explicit biases that are often normalized in staff meetings and professional developments. Um, I myself have been a part of uh, receiving professional development and staff meetings. And I can't tell you how often some of those meetings have been very offensive. And so we need to shift how we do those things and who we hire to provide these type of services to our educators. Another way I think we can shift the work culture is invest time and money increase salary and incentives, create pathways and opportunities to promote, especially for early ed childhood educators. 
I myself uh, was in an early childhood education uh, teacher, coordinator, manager, and I can tell you some of the districts that I've worked for, there is no pathway to upper management. So literally you stay in a teaching position. There's no journey to leadership. And I think we need to create ways of transitioning and promoting and shout and and using what we have because we have people who have so many gifts and talents. It may be time for them to take to step up, but we need to make pathways for them to be able to promote, to use and expand on the gifts they already have and come in with. Next slide. Uh oh, I'm sorry. Not yet. Go back. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say. Since I'm a relationship based person, I believe in creating safe, brave spaces. I cannot say that enough. And safety means people genuinely feel relaxed enough, and their nervous system is at a calm place where they don't feel like they have to come in prepared to defend. And so one of the things I'd like to offer and that I have already done is offer monthly reflective groups that support African-American educators. Our lived experience is very different and how we navigate this world is very different from our counterparts. And sometimes when we're in these spaces, they can be very hard and oppressive. I know that's a strong word, but I'd like for you to sit with that because some of you may be able to resonate with that. Just feeling like you don't belong, like there's these <laughs> clicks sometimes that happen and there's these things that people hold their beliefs about African-American people in general. And it's in the workplace running rapid. Let's say that. Some things I believe in is I have done these. I offer reflective groups that provide opportunities to share wisdom the pro and the processing of the work that can be very challenging and overwhelming. And this let, let's not forget all those expectations that come into play. Um, brave spaces that support and validate their unique experience is needed. When, we, when people feel cared for, they relax, they do more. You, you begin to see a different person. We have to change these environments. I organize and facilitate reflective groups for educators so I know the need and value of reflective groups personally. It's an opportunity just to be among people where you don't have to over explain yourself. It's an opportunity where you can just look and you have no, you don't have to say a word. It's already understood and greeted with compassion. I also suggest offer decompression activities, be creative. And please let's go beyond potlucks and pizza parties. Let, let's, let's not do that anymore. Um, I think educators are worth a lot more than potlucks and pizza parties. <laughs> Let's be real. Next slide. Be intentional. Diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility are actionable items that require movement. I can't tell you how many trainings I've been in and sat on uh, with fellow uh, colleagues that really see this as a check the box. And I am more than just a check the box. I matter. All African-American black teachers, educators around the world matter. We're, not, we're more than just a check box. Next slide. So the research is clear. As you can see on the slide, African-American students who have at least one African-American teacher are more likely to graduate, uh, drop out, pursue a college education, but there's a plot twist. 
and the plot twist was mentioned earlier. All students benefit from having an African-American educator. All do. Next slide. I want to go back to Wilhelmina Henry. And this is something she was quoted as saying. It didn't faze me at all that the children were not black. Love is the answer. Was her popular model throughout her career and life's work. She praised her students, applauded their success, and established positive family-like relationships with them. That is the only thing that works, Henry said. Negative comments do nothing but destroy adults and children. Love. Next slide. Bottom line, we need more, we need more African-American educators. That's it. That's all. No quantitative data can effectively explain the value of us. To those that do not understand the value and traditions of narratives, I challenge you to lean into the qualitative data to give light to what numbers miss. We are so much more. Thank you for allowing me to be a living representation of those African-American educators before me and those to come. I'm Dr. Stewart and thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. Look at all of this love that you're getting in the chat. That was such an amazing presentation. Lots of claps, lots of hearts. And you know what? I, I really enjoyed the laughing emoji faces when you were talking about potlucks and pizza because those are very popular, right? We all know that. As a past teacher myself, I'm very aware of those potlucks and pizzas. <laughs> So thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, for that wonderful presentation on looking toward our future and the why behind the need for more African-American educators. We're going to be moving into our panel discussion to have some more rich discussions and to continue this conversation. To start the next slide, we will introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion, who I'm also really excited to introduce today. And it looks like we have already moved on to the next slide. So. For today's panel discussion, our moderator is Dr. Jacqueline Ollison. Dr. Jacqueline, or Dr. J, is co-director of the California Teacher Residency Lab and an instructor for UC or Univer University of California Merced's Teacher Credentialing Program. She focuses on retaining and supporting educators of color and training new teachers to be equity-minded, effective, and compassionate so they stay in the profession. She is driven by her commitment to ensure all students receive an excellent education. In addition, Dr. J was featured on TEDx and sits on the boards of Safe Black Space and Torlakson Whole Child Institute. Links to this work will be dropped in the chat soon. Thank you, Dr. J. We are glad to have you here to moderate our panel discussion. Dr. J will now be introducing our wonderful panelists that we have here today that will be engaging with her in conversations around our panel discussion questions. So I will go ahead and pass it over to Dr. J. If we can go to the next slide, please. Well, thank you, Valentina. I am so glad to be here to moderate this important topic. And I'm just, just kind of basking in the warmth and love that our GRIO shared with us today, that amazing information. And um, as we begin, I just wanna just say that I'm reminded of the James Baldwin quote in which he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I just wanna say that this topic is so important and necessary, and I'm so grateful for all the work that all of you are doing to face, to, doing to face this. And so with that, to begin our introduction of our panelists that will be participating in our panel discussion, I would like to start with Mrs. Lanre Ajay. Mrs. Lanre Ajay is the coordinator of the West Contra Costa Unified School District, CSSP. She has been in the field of education for 46 years as an instructional aide, elementary school teacher, special education teacher, vice principal, principal, and coordinator. 
Yes, Mrs. Sanjay. She understands the needs of diverse student populations okay. and confidently serves as a strong advocate for all students and staff. She has established a culture of continuous improvement throughout all aspects of her organization. Due to her leadership and support, the use of data has been firmly entrenched in her district's early learning preschool program. Second is Dr. Janet Schultz. Dr. Schultz has served as the proud superintendent of Pittsburgh Unified School District since July of 2014. Dr. Schultz received her BS in secondary education and English um, from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and her master's in educational leadership from the University of Texas, El Paso. She earned a master's degree of education and her doctor of education in administration, planning, and social policy from Harvard University, where she was in the urban superintendent's program. During her time in Pittsburgh, um, Unified School District, um, her highlights include a plan for recruitment and retention of a diverse staff. Graduation rates have increased by 18%, and the district was recognized by the College Board for increases in access to advanced placement courses. Next slide, please. Third is Adora Fisher, the Executive Director of Educator Preparation Programs at Santa Clara County Office of Education. Adora leads programs that address both school administrative credentialing, general and special education teaching credentialing, and behavioral health professional credentialing and licensing programs. It's a mouthful. In addition, Adora has designed and developed an educator workforce pathways program, which supports potential educators with navigating licensing and credentialing program systems from preschool through career, as well as mental and behavioral health credentialing licensing programs. The goals of the educator preparation programs are to support education that embeds equity, social justice, and inclusion principles throughout its offerings, but also to target potential educators of color, and ensure they complete their programs debt-free, that's huge, increasing opportunities for prosperity, as well as opportunities to develop generational wealth over time. Due to Adora's leadership, fiscal and informational barriers are being removed for a diverse teaching pool to respond to the local and state needs for credentialed and licensed educators. Adora has co-written and attained over $25 million in grant funds that subsidize the total tuition cost for candidates to earn a credential in the field of education. Currently, 500 fully credentialed education educators have entered the workforce under her leadership. Adora approaches all of her work with equity and inclusion in mind and is a leader with a passion for social justice work that directly impacts current generations of color and generations to come. And our final panelist introduction is Mr. Brandon Okonkwo. Brandon Okonkwo is a second year first grade teacher at Hidden Springs Elementary School in Moreno Valley Unified School District. One of his favorite things is witnessing the tremendous growth his first graders experience from the beginning of the school year to when spring quarter rolls around. Seeing them inspires him to strive to do better as well. Next slide, please. The questions we will be discussing today are, first, how can California's education system meet the needs of uh, prospective Black educators to diversify our P3 workforce? Second, what supports or resources do you offer Black educators? What strategies do you think are most effective in returning Black educators? And how do you support Black educators in the face of limited diversity? For example, when there may only be one or two educators of color in a given space. Anybody know what that's like? <laughs> Today is not that day, but in most spaces, a lot of the time. And then third, we're going to be um, asking the, our panelists to share an experience when they felt that their community representation and education has benefited all children, but specifically young Black children. And then finally, um, we're going to ask to close out the panel. Um, and this is, I think, is on the next slide. Um, what would you recommend to leaders here today to authentically create supportive environments for the Black workforce to allow Black educators the opportunity to provide successful and nurturing teaching experiences? Um, and, a, you know, a sub-question to that might be, how can schools, districts, and early education programs make Black P3 educators feel supported, seen, and valued as integral parts of children's education? So we are better able to retain our current Black P3 educators. And so with that, we're going to stop screen sharing and we're going to begin our panel discussion, starting with our first question. 
How can California's education system meet the needs of prospective Black educators to, vers- uh, to diversify our P3 workforce? So, Mr. O'Conkle, I think I'm going to go to you first. What do you think? Um, I think that's uh, fine. Uh, and I just want to just say um, thank you again to Dr. Stewart. I just that whole entire presentation just left me feeling very validated um, as a person and an educator within this uh, career. So that was just really uplifting. Um, but as far as to answer the question, um, I think one thing that could help, uh, before I started teaching, I would substitute teach in three different districts. And one of the benefits of that is just getting to meet different teachers, <clears throat> from all different walks of life that one may not get to do um, if they just, you know, stay within the district and school and the site that they're hired at. So speaking with them and then reflecting on what I've experienced myself, I do think it would be nice if Black educators weren't the ones that were responsible for a lot of behavior problems. I know that uh, when a grade level might plan for who to place their students within the following year. Um, a lot of times they'll go to the Black educator because the expectation is that we are harder or we are more resilient. Um, we can connect better with these students that are, you know, proportionately um, or disproportionately difficult in the classroom, but they happen to be students of color, so they're Black, and then they think, well, if we pair them with this teacher, that'll be helpful. Um, it can be really taxing and um, really frustrating as well. And it, when you know that's kind of like what you're like looking forward to, in addition to everything else that you have to do um, as a teacher and what you have to contend with, um, I know that can lead to a lot of burnout, um, or people might feel like they're only looked at as um, someone to take care of discipline and rather than look for um, as someone for their teaching um, and what we can spread to our students. So I think that that's something that we should be mindful of, that admin at site should be mindful of. So looking over those rosters, making sure that um, those behavior issues, which we know are going to be there, um, but that they're dispersed equally um, among a team. And, you know, teachers who have more background and more um, experience are getting some of those students rather than piling them on on one teacher especially if that teacher is black and they're new because that seems to be a recurring pattern too that new teachers will get the brunt of behavior issues when they don't have the experience um you know to handle that myriad of students that they have to connect with so i think that that's something that can be addressed um just from my experience in uh, the districts that i've worked at and the teachers that i've spoken with Yes, thank you, Sir Conco, for sharing that. Uh, definitely boils down to that professional courtesy and respect of you as a teacher and what your role is. Adora, um, what are you thinking when we're talking about meeting the needs of prospective Black educators to diversify our P3 workforce? How can so, the system do that? So where I go to is is the work that I do, right? And and I prepare teachers. That's the main focus of my position. And I have to say that as I do this work, what I'm recognizing are the barriers there are, especially for for teachers of color. And and that old, I don't know that it's old, but the saying that the system is doing exactly what it was built to do is so true as I look at the system that's been built for um, entry into education. Uh, one uh, really small example is, is testing, right? And all of the testing that teachers have to go through and the cost of those tests that teachers have to burden. So even before you get a job and are able to actually enter the profession, you have to pass these tests, but first you've got to have the funding to pay for them. So that's not even about tuition, that's about paying for testing. The other thing that um, is is low hanging fruit to me is subject matter competency. In preparation programs, um, along with these testing situations, uh, teachers can waiver the test if they have certain um, subject matter competency or they majored in certain areas. So, for example, a teacher who majored in um, dance, interesting, enough, doesn't have to take CSET. But a teacher who majored in humanities has to take the CSET. And the CSET is a very long, almost full day uh, of testing 
that covers every subject that a teacher might have to teach while in a multiple subject classroom, for example. And so the question is, most um, students of color generally major in humanities. Mm -hmm. And so humanities cannot, uh, majors cannot waver the CSET. And so there again, it's a built, um, in, built into the system that um, these barriers that are meant to keep certain populations out of the system. So I need to be able to afford to pay for the testing. I need to be able to afford to pay for my tuition. And um, I can't get out of either one of them because I happen to major in psychology or sociology, mm -hmm. right? Which you would think would be something um, that would we would want teachers to major in. Um, mm -hmm because it closely relates to child development. <laughs> um, the other thing that's really important, if you dig a little deeper, is, um, is, is once teachers actually get a position, the, the um, issues that arise and, and the barriers that exist once you enter the field of education are um, salary, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm putting salary out there because it is something we can no longer not discuss. It has to be discussed. And this is true of all teachers, but specifically teachers of color, because teachers of color do not have necessarily generational wealth that they can depend on to get to them through college and to help them get through teaching credentialing pro programs. They don't necessarily own homes where they can borrow against the equity in a home to pay for all of these things. And then when they get a job, the salary is so low that they're paying back loans instead of trying to establish wealth. And so those are just a few of the barriers. Um, some of them we can do something about immediately and others, it's going to take some time. Wow. I mean, just listening to you talk about all those barriers, I, I definitely think that um, Mrs. Ajay is going to have a lot to ponder and consider as she chimes in and answers this question. Um, so Mrs. Ajay, what are, you, what are you thinking about right now when it comes to what the system can do? To Actually, uh, two things. Number one, what Mr. Konko said. Um, um, most of the discipline is being done by, you know, black teachers at the uh, at the site. But mm -hmm. another thing is also assuming that the black teacher is the sports guy. You know, they are usually given that as uh, you know, oh, you are, you are supposed to do basketball or something like that. So the pressure is there, and they are not prepared for all things like that. Then, but also what Adora said about uh, preparation for being a teacher, most of the teachers don't have that money to, you know, go into, uh, especially black and brown teachers. And that's an area. And also in early childhood, most of the teachers are black and brown and they are not paid well. My district is different. Our district pays our preschool teachers just like any teacher in the district, which is fantastic. But they're expected to have their credentials. And how do they get into credential leave program if they can't afford it? But what we've done to support them is to encourage, like, for example, in my program, what I do, all the trainings that are done for teachers are done for the aides so that when they want to become teachers, it's easy for them. They already have most of the trainings and the professional development. Um, one of the things that we can do to retain teachers uh, because we've been talking about recruitment, what about retaining them? Mm -hmm. Something that we don't really think about is the mental health services that are needed by teachers. Racism is real. Discrimination is real. And when you are just one out of maybe several teachers at a campus and you don't even have somebody to talk to, maybe we could provide mental health services that can help them to navigate the system. And also, even teaching kids right from preschool how to be resilient. That should be part of the, you know, especially for black and brown kids. You'll be surprised that preschool students are suspended. Not in my district anyway, but in some districts you find 
little kids, they are being suspended at the age of three because they're acting. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we need to start thinking about. Uh, yes. And also fostering inclusion, you know, making sure that our black and brown teachers are included in decision making. Most of the time, they are not even given the opportunity to lead um, PDs or to, to, you know, to lead at the school site. And that also beats you down as, as a black and brown teacher. Um, thank you so much for um, just looking up those important areas. Salary is key. Like Adora and you both stated, if you don't have that money or that funding, in, you know, as part of, you know, a lack of generational wealth, how can you get to where you need to go to? Dr. Schultz, I'm wondering, um, I'm going to have you have the last word on this question in terms of, you know, what you think we can do as a California education system to meet the needs of our prospective Black educators. Thank you. Um, when I was listening to Dr. Stewart, the word intentional and intentionality really stood out to me. And I think that school districts have to be very intentional in their recruitment and their retention strategies. What that looks like for us is we have a specific board goal around recruitment and retention of a diverse work workforce. We have it in our LCAP. Yes, you can have it in your LCAP. You can have specific strategies around recruiting Black teachers, around recruiting a diverse workforce, around your professional development. So having it be um, part of what you do as a district and naming it as something that is very important and a priority in your district helps make it intentional. Other things that we are intentional about that I think is really important, um, some of what Dr. Stewart touched on as well too, is working with our administrators so that they are creating an environment that is welcoming for the interview process. Mm -hmm. Does the panel have people who could who are reflecting, who may be interviewing. Um, we have equity questions that they're required to use that gets at the heart of teaching and learning um, for the scholars that we serve. And then another thing that we do is um, publicly report our data. And so we do a yearly tracking of our hiring and we look at it and compare over the years so that we are being very intentional about where do we need to have more efforts? What, um, how are we looking across as a whole district? And then also at individual school sites. So why we have, for example, uh, um, approximately 12% African-American certificated staff in our district, that's not the case in all of our schools. So we have some with a higher percentage, some with a lower. So then that means we have to really look at how can we be very intentional when opportunities come up as well too. So I would just focus on um, that word intentionality and really making sure that across a system in a school district, those um, that it's talked about, that it's recognized and that there are intentional actions to mm -hmm. increase the black workforce. Mm, yes. Yeah. You know, you've all named several things that we could be thinking about when it comes to, you know, putting into the system to diversify the workforce. And Dr. Schultz, you just talked about some strategies that are pretty effective on the flip side, you know, around retention. I was wondering, um, you know, especially like the hiring that you were talking about, the interview process, being transparent with the data, tracking publicly who you're hiring so you can see where you need more effort. Um, Ms. Ajay, I was wondering, um, as you think about retention, because I know you started to talk about that, what, do you, what are some supports or resources that we should be offering to Black educators? And of those, what strategies do you think are most effective in retaining Black educators? I think you're on mute. I didn't unmute, yeah. Okay. One that's really important to me is mentorship. Um, I think in order for us to support them, we need to have mentors that are, you know, African Americans too, who have been through, you know, uh, who has gone through some of the issues they are going through themselves. They are able to support the, uh, you know, the new teachers and make sure that, you know, we retain them. It's really, it's very, very important. Then also uh, giving them professional development. 
that would hone their skills so that they can perform um, mm -hmm. and be able to, you know, you know, to feel seen, heard, and uh, feel valued. Because uh, if you don't have the skills to uh, meet the needs of all the students, you will know it yourself and you will feel inadequate. So giving them, the, you know, the professional development that they need. Um, I think it was during the presentation, we talked about affinity groups, having a group where they can have um, open communication, uh, where they can feel free to be themselves instead of being on guard all the time. It happens all the time. I've been through it. I've been in this business for 46 years. I know how it feels to be the only one in the room. Um, mm -hmm. You don't want the younger ones to feel that. You want them to be able to come because, the, you know, they have all the skills. But if you don't have the confidence, then how are you going to perform? And sometimes the way they, they see black people when they are really passionate or they are mm -hmm. really educated, they know what they are talking about, they think they are a threat. No, they shouldn't be. And we also have to mentor people to know that, hey, if you have something to say, say if you know something, let people know that you know it. You don't have to hide. You don't have to be ap apologetic for, for having the skills that, you know, that would advance your career. So those are some of the things that I, I'm thinking of uh, about. Um, um, also, give them the genuine opportunity to lead, not mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, let's try, maybe he can do it or not. No, just give them the opportunity to lead and also give them the skills to do that. Yes. So Mr. Okoko, I know Ms. Jaye shared a lot of things. I was wondering what was resonating with you, um, uh, not only of what she said, but you know, also what you think might be necessary to um, support our, uh, Black educators, and especially that are those supports that are most effective in retaining Black educators. Um, I think one of the supports that can be done is what educators in general uh, specific, uh, specifically in um, elementary school have to do in terms of just making their students feel seen and heard. You know, we we make sure that we honor diversity. We make sure that we honor where they come from. Um, you know, we celebrate birthdays. We say their names. Um, we talk about their experiences. Give them the platform, you know, to share about what they've done over the weekend or what they're excited and proud about. And um, that has a lot of power, you know, coming from us. And it really can sway the opinions of their peers. And I feel like that should also be applied with staff. So admin making sure that they are recognizing their um, Black teachers, you know, if they have any evidence-based strategies that they're utilizing, you know, mentioning that during staff meetings saying, hey, like, we noticed that this teacher was able to get these students from this point with their reading to this point, or they really have great relationships with their parents. And these are some of the strategies that they, that they do. Um, because sometimes you don't necessarily get to know what a teacher does. And those meetings are a great window. So that way you can hear the strategies or at least like the mentalities that your peers have that you may not see. You know, for example, I don't really um, see what my fifth grade peers do in their classrooms, but at the staff meetings, I know. So just making sure that we're doing that, not necessarily doing it as a handout, making sure it's authentic, but, you know, making sure that you're sharing that so that way you can help open the door um, in a sense of a building community so other peers can start to respect their black educators or at least be interested um you know and you can just help cultivate those relationships and if you don't know then all the more reason to get in those classrooms and um just be you know just happen to see what they're doing for 20 30 minutes or so ask their students like hey like what are you learning and etc what do you like about this class so that way you can get a better picture and idea um and then you can relay that with the team to again help build that community of um, appreciation, understanding, and visibility that may not otherwise be there because, you know, if nothing is said, then someone kind of might feel like they're unseen. And then it goes back to what Ms. Ajayi was saying about how you're there and you're alone. And especially in these workforces where you may be the only Black educator, um, as I am at my site, and it just feels like, well, what I'm doing doesn't matter or it's not like enough. And you just want to be cognizant of those possible feelings that your educators of color could have. Mm, 
Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, I, I can say so many things to what you're sharing, but I am imagining that Adora and Dr. Schultz are chomping at the bit, wanting to jump in here as well. So um, we'll, we'll go to Adora. Is anything um, else that you might want to share or add to this discussion around what would be most effective here for our Black educators? I think that word intentionality um, that Dr. Schultz uh, brought up and was brought up in the um, keynote earlier is really resonates with me. When mm -hmm. we're working with Black educators, um, the actions have to be intentional. Um, we, we have to think about creating intentional opportunities for Black educators to uh, be in the limelight, to be accessible, to be seen in leadership roles at the district level, at the school site level, um, mm -hmm. and really start to consider where are our Black educators in our districts? Where are they seen? Where are they heard? Where are they put uh, up as models? In districts, often um, people move up into po leadership positions because they're tapped on the shoulder. And and I believe that in order to um, um, retain our Black educators, we have to give them voice. We have to give them ownership of the educational field or, or arena that they're working in. We have to give them opportunities for decision making. And we have to give them opportunities for leadership. And it has to be purposeful and intentional. And I think that is one thing that... Um, that I don't know that we've done a great job of. I, I so appreciate Dr. Schultz talking about writing that into their LCAP goals. So, mm -hmm. and then measuring how, how are we doing on this? What do we, you know, are we making progress toward diversifying the teacher workforce, especially in terms of Black educators and diversifying leadership? in terms of Black educators. The other thing I think that's really important is that at the site level, site administrators really need to be trained in cultural awareness and how to manage diverse um, staff. We say hire for diversity, but then we don't think that diversity has to be managed. And it has to be managed in a way that is sensitive to the various cultures that, with, or that are within a school. When we bring cultures together, there are often culture clashes because we all are raised differently and have different values and traditions and mindsets. And what may be perceived as people not getting along or being difficult is really a cultural issue. It's not at all a, a characteristic or a uh, personality issue, but that's what we go to. And then HR gets involved and uh, um, especially with black educators, the passion that we see in black educators can also often be labeled as uh, anger or aggressiveness when in all actuality, um, they're just passionate and expressing their passion. And, and, and if that's not understood, it leads to down a pathway that is not um, supportive or beneficial to Black educators. Mm. Yes, yes. So I, I'm going to give you some snaps. I can see in the chat there you're getting a lot of claps and loves there <laughs> because that's, you know, managing diversity. I've heard of affirming diversity, but thinking about managing diversity, that's an inter interesting concept there. And um, Dr. Schultz, I mean, I mean, you you talked about your, you know, that 12 percent of your staff are African-American teachers. And when the state is like 4 percent, I'm just wondering, what are you all doing to support educators in the face of, you know, this limited diversity? What are some things that might be, you know, that others should be thinking about that will be effective in retaining black educators? Well, I'm glad this is being recorded. So that means I can go back and take all the notes from everyone who's speaking because, you know, I agree with everything. There's so many great ideas. I think um, listening to to Black educators and making sure that, again, we're intentional about how we have spaces for that to happen. So on our diversity and hiring committee, you know, we have Black educators on there to give their viewpoint of and also community members of how we can do better in our hiring 
we're working this year with the Black Teacher Project. And so my hope with this is that that creates a safe space for our um, Black educators to really give feedback, you know, in, in an authentic way that we can then learn and grow from about what we can do better across our system. So I think that's another strategy that's really important. And um, again, emphasizing professional development opportunities and ways where um, where our African-American educators can see a pathway to leadership as well too. We partner with CASA, the California Association of African-American um, School Superintendents and Administrators. And we made, again, an intentional decision that that's our main conference that we attend as a district. So we send about 50 educators. And so along with our some of our administrators who go, we send a large group of teachers as well, too, because and really obviously focusing on our African-American, our Black educators to attend this conference so that we're all attending together and, and having sessions, but then coming back and debriefing. And then that helps us inform our LCAP as well, too, and hopefully gives people a way where they can see a pathway towards leadership as well, too, because they're interacting with other Black administrators and being able to, you know, see people across the whole state that that they can look to as for role models as well. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, we've been talking so much about just beautiful opportunities for effective strategies, for retention, and what we think needs to be placed in the system. If I could take a moment here and then just think about um, why it's so important that we do this work and how having this representation in the community can benefit all children. What I'm specifically wondering and thinking about is whether or not you like we'll start with you, Mrs. Najai. Have you had an experience where you felt that um, your community representation and education benefited the children you were working with? And if so, what was a what is it about that experience that stood out? And is there something within that experience that we can replicate across the state that others can do to kind of emulate that? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, as you all know, that uh, we tend to identify with people that. Uh, we are culturally um, related to. So usually when you have a black educator uh, in a classroom where there are a lot of black kids, they tend to, you know, there's there's that bond. And that was my experience teaching at a non-public school. And like mm -hmm. I said, my students came directly from the psychiatric unit uh, and they were labeled as emotionally disturbed. Uh, most of them were African-American, and uh, students of color. But you walk into my classroom, I remember it's in San Francisco, I remember the uh, mayor coming to my classroom and he said, where are the kids? And I said, these are my kids. And he said, oh, because there was a, um, a, uh, a case that he needed to come and see at my site. It was a big case, that was in the 90s. And, uh, and I said, oh yeah. These are my students. And he said, how do you do it? I said, do what? The reason was because they were expecting them to be throwing things in the classroom, not attending to things. No, but my classroom, being uh, a black woman, was I saw those kids as my children. That's the first thing. That love, the connection, and also knowing their different learning styles, and I knew what they needed. It wasn't the academic part per se. They needed the love and I was able to give it. And the academic came, you know, after that. And they were able to outperform other students and they were able to transition back to public schools. That's one case. Another case, it's uh, when I was a principal of a school that was mostly um, uh, Caucasian students, but I had a few African-American students and I decided that every Friday, being an African lady, I'll wear my African outfit. And I was always wearing my African outfit to school on, on, uh, on Friday. And the kids, especially the black kids, they came to me and they said, oh, we are black too. Can we wear our outfit? I said, sure. Anybody can wear any outfit. But what I did, 
I did not celebrate black history the way it was celebrated because people tended to deal with food. It has nothing to do with food. People needed to know about their culture. So instead of saying black history or black month, I did multicultural for all mm. my students. And you could see even kids that came from Germany, they were saying, but we don't, I said, just wear a t-shirt and put German on it. And, and they loved it. And they were able to do history through that, geography, and it, w they were able to read, they were able to write, and that made me feel good. And every Friday you come to my site, I was in my African outfit. And those kids, even those who didn't have African outfit, one said, oh, I want to be an Indian. I said, go for it. So the mom went and got high sari. So those are some of the things they were able to relate. And, <laughs> and it was a very high performing school. And uh, mm -hmm. that, I, you know, I was the principal at that school, you know, distinguished mm -hmm. school of California for that matter. But we brought that cultural piece to that, to that site. And I, I'm still there, and which I'm really happy about. But also another thing that can be replicated is teaching of social skills. I believe highly in teaching of those skills right from the beginning. All classes mm -hmm. need it, even high school, I believe, because any a uh, program that I have been in charge, I've made sure that social skills is being taught. So that those skills can have those training and the skills that would they will need beyond the school, that they will need, you know, once they get, you know, older or in the workforce. So that's mm. my experience. You have that, like I've often heard of that, you know, that withedness, that it vibe, that black girl, black woman magic that we just have. But what you also shared here was that it's not just magic, right? You're intentionally making sure that you are seeing your students, seeing the humanity, um, connecting with them, helping them navigate social, emotional skills and needs, and just really loving on them, right? It's not magic. These are things that can be done. And I'm curious, and this question is either for you, Brandon, or Adora. Are there, is there anything you would want to say? Is there an experience that you felt, um, when you felt that your community representation and education benefited all children? Brandon, you or Mr. Okonkwo, do you want to chime in here? Yeah, my, um, unfortunately, my background isn't as extensive as my um, fellow panelists, but in my short time of being an educator so far, relatively speaking, there is one moment that has stood out, um, but a little background before I get to that, but the context will help. Growing up, um, you know, I didn't really see a lot of hairstyles for Black men. So oftentimes my hair would be cut short. Um, and for those that know, the most I would be able to do would be like a fade. That's what my dad would do. It would either be a one over in short or a fade and that was it. And I remember I would go to school and I would see, you know, my Caucasian peers, my Hispanic peers just have these really cool hairstyles, but knowing that that I, I would never be able to replicate something like that. Um, and there were comments I would get where people would say like, oh, like, you know, you need to get a haircut, like your hair is short. Or if I did get a haircut, they would say, well, what's like changed? Um, so when I went to college and finished towards the end of my undergraduate career, that's when I started exploring and learning about different hairstyles that as a black male I could have. Um, and one of the hairstyles that was, my hair was longer than it is now, but I would texturize it and then use like a, um, Cool. something to like give me like curls it looked like really cool so one day when I was teaching um, a long-term assignment in this fifth grade classroom uh there was a student true who was black and after we had finished teaching you know he asked in front of everyone like Mr. Okonkwo how do I get my hair to look like yours you know it looks really cool and that took me aback because you know my growing up I I would never expected any attention to my hair. And as someone who's, you know, still in that journey of exploring what to do with it and, you know, learning to now become proud of it and to enjoy it, to have that recognized by a student, um, a student that I could relate to, to have a student actually aspire to have something similar. And, you know, just it really goes back to that visibility piece. You know, he saw something in me that he could possibly achieve um, that may not have been, you know, possible otherwise with someone who wasn't a, per a man of color, a, a Black educator. So um, we had a really cool conversation after that. And um, he started to work on it because it, you know, it takes time and um, effort to grow it out. But that's just something that always made me feel good about who I am. And I think as for him as well, and it was just a great, neat opportunity for the class in general to talk about hair textures and styles that I don't think 
they would have been aware of, you know, otherwise. So not something um, that's been huge, but it was a moment that I thought was um, really special to me and hopefully um, to him as well. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I just got like the chills when you said that. It's so important to be able to have people where you can see yourself in them. You can see yourself being a teacher because your teacher has hair like you or you want to be cool like that. And it just is amazing. And I am mindful of time and we weren't able to get through all of our questions, but there were so many beautiful things that people were saying. And I just want to take one brief moment, Valentina. Let me just highlight a couple of things. Okay, what people were sharing today do you hear some of the actionable steps I think that we should be thinking about? Let's think about professional courtesy and respect of our Black educators. We shouldn't be overburdening them with being the disciplinarian at the site or taking on all the sports, right? They have just as much education, if not more, most of the time, right? And that should be respected. So there are discipline issues. Now we got to work with all teachers to handle their own, right? Instead of giving it to just one group. So let's think about that. Let's think about removing arbitrary barriers to getting your license, right? Why do we have subject matter waivers that waive areas like dance and not, um, you know, and where areas like dance and math and science only as opposed to majors that are in the humanities, knowing that a lot of people of color take, you know, major in things that are the humanities. So it's like we've got this waiver system it works for everyone except for black educators. What's going on with that, right? Let's think about money. Generational wealth has been a systemic issue here in this country. Black people have historically been kept out of that and amassing a lot of wealth. And so when we don't pay them, how do we then turn around and expect them to be able or pay them well? How do we turn around and expect them to be able to pay for credentialing programs or these tests? And then I want us to think about, think about the love and the intentionality that comes when we are present in these spaces, when we, when kids can see us and they know that we care about them and we're affirming them. And let's also affirm our educators. And then lastly, I think since if you can uh, tie accountability to the recruitment and retention of ed educators, especially in the early um, education space, putting goals in your LCAP, and you can continue to ensure, at least ensure that people will be doing this work because it's something that they'll be held accountable for doing. I just want to, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this panel and to publicly say thank you all for doing the necessary work to ensure California's diverse student population has highly prepared, effective teachers who mirror their diversity and see their potential and humanity. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J, uh, Dr. Stewart, and panelists for such rich discussion um, and for speaking the truth. Uh, as we begin to close, I'd like to highlight State Superintendent Tony Thurman's insightful focus to transform California schools with initiatives that support the diversification of the teacher workforce. Instituting universal pre-K and TK elevates the position and pay of those in our profession, mostly educators of color who serve our youngest learners, our preschool teachers. That $2.7 billion investment, along with the $4 billion investment into community schools, provides support for students and families, but also unique opportunities for professional learning for teachers and school staff during the school day. Recognizing the need for to recruit educators, our state superintendent has pushed for the Golden State Teacher Grant Program that awards up to $20,000 for teacher preparation programs. In addition, the Classified School Employee Teacher Credentialing Program continues to grant awards up to $4,800 per year for teacher candidates to complete their undergraduate and teacher preparation programs. Teacher residencies, as you've learned, is also an excellent pathway to support educators entering the profession in the most supportive way, which allows them to earn a living wage. Those funds increased recently from $25,000 to $40,000 per candidate for school districts to support their residency program. To learn more about becoming a teacher in California, please reach out to us at teachnca.cde.ca.gov. Now, as stated earlier, we know that well-prepared teachers stay in the profession. 
Under our superintendent's leadership, we have seen historic investments into professional learning through grants and programs like our Educator Effectiveness Funds, our Anti-Bias Education Grant Program, that's helping to make schools safe and inclusive places for all kids and families and, and staff. And the, the $25 million supporting our national board uh, for professional teaching standards, incentive, and subsidy program. This program has seen significant increases in the numbers of teachers of color pursuing this professional honor. Leadership also matters, as we've heard today, and serves to support and retain teachers of color. Ongoing support for administrators through the 21st Century California School Leadership Academy and opportunities for professional development and growth through literacy coaches and reading specialist grants continues to encourage black teachers to come to teaching, to stay in teaching and to be effective educators. Lastly, I'd like to mention the Educator Diversity Advisory Group that State Superintendent initiated in 2021. This was led by Travis, Dr. Travis Bristol from UC Berkeley. And this group provided recommendations on how CDE can help to recruit, support and retain teachers of color across the state. Based on those recommendations, we are continuing to work with a statewide community of practice around diversifying the teacher workforce, which discusses best practices and educator diversity work that's happening across the state. I invite school districts who are interested in joining this community of practice, please let me know. See cotton at cde.ca.gov. Uh, Dr. Olson actually just presented earlier this week <laughs> on that community of practice. There are many other resources that I could share with you today, and more importantly, much more work to be done. I'd like to leave you with the words of Thurgood Marshall as we think about centering and cultivating the preschool through third grade black teacher workforce. Education is the foundation upon which we will build our future. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So everyone, on behalf of Cheryl, myself, and our State Superintendent Tony Thurmond, thank you so much for joining us this late afternoon and evening for centering and cultivating the Black workforce to strengthen P3 alignment. Your attendance demonstrates more than just a growth mindset, but a dedication to learning more authentic ways to center and cultivate the voices of Black educators and our Black students. We're confident that you leave us this evening and you will continue your journey of creating more diverse teaching environments to recruit and retain more Black educators for the benefit of all students and families, but specifically our Black children. I have to again thank everyone. So Dr. Stewart, your wonderful presentation that was so powerful and left us all in awe with your stories. For our moderator, Dr. Olson, who I've long considered a friend and someone I admire, just getting to be back in the same space with you and to hear you was wonderful. And our panelists, Adora Fisher, Brandon Okonoma, Mrs. Lanre Ayaya, sorry, I think I didn't quite say that one correctly, and Dr. That's Janet right. Schultz. For, thank you for such rich discussions. No one ever gets my name right either. Um, and... I want to thank our P3 team, Shanna, Valentina, Beth, Sterling, Steve, Steve, and Teresa. Thank you for what you did in TSD and our ASL team. We're going to leave you with a quote that we felt captured for why we actually feel this is so critical. Having a strand that focused really specifically on centering, celebrating the magic of Black students and educators. From you are your best thing, vulnerability, shame, resilience, and the Black experience, Tanara Burke. You have to engage with Black humanity because the expansiveness of our humanity is so great that it reaches to other people. As we heard earlier from Dr. Stewart, all students benefit from having a Black educator, all students. So have a good evening, everyone. And let's go off and make some of that magic happen so that all of our students thrive. <laughs>